You're listening to a podcast from the South China Morning Post. The global news cycle is buzzing with the news. Breaking news for you this morning, because in the last few minutes, we've heard that the first coronavirus vaccine has been approved for use. The United Kingdom has become the first country in the world to approve the Pfizer coronavirus vaccine. The first COVID-19 vaccine, one of them at least, has been officially authorized for production. The first batch will start rolling out next week. Saying it has met strict standards for safety, quality and effectiveness. This is monumental and it's going to put incredible pressure on our own regulators to get this so we'll have this within the next 10 days. As I speak to you, the United Kingdom has announced there will be 800,000 doses, enough for 400,000 people, to be deployed for a network of hospitals next week. Remember, this is just one of the 11 vaccines that are in the final phase three clinical trials. The team behind this vaccine is a partnership of three companies, Pfizer from the United States, BioNTech from Germany, and Forshan Pharma, based in Shanghai. This really is a moment where the world has worked together to overcome an existential threat. Here's what my colleague Josephine Ma had to say back in our March episode about the challenge for humanity to make a COVID-19 vaccine. And the WHO director actually said earlier that they are expecting a vaccine to be ready in 18 months. And for that, 18 months, that's already rocket speed for vaccine development. Some scientists are actually quite shocked because it's unprecedented. I mean, it's very ambitious. Welcome to the latest Inside China COVID-19 podcast. My name is Kinling Lo. In this episode, you are going to hear an update from Josephine. And you will also hear another familiar voice from the newsroom here at the South China Morning Post. Simone McCarthy will return with some insights into another huge ongoing story. The quest to find out where the coronavirus really started. They're both filing regular stories and analysis as part of our 24-hour news coverage online at scmp.com. Make sure you check in for the latest. In this episode, we're also going to look at the cold, hard reality of what it means to try and vaccinate 7.5 billion people living on this planet. It's not going to happen by Christmas. It's not even going to happen by next year. We are going to have to adapt our lives in the meantime to what is being referred to as a COVID normal existence. And that's where a particular kind of technology that was developed in Japan in the mid 1990s for car factories comes in. It has also become part of everyday life in mainland China. I'm talking about QR codes. We are going to drop in to Beijing to look at the technology that Chinese President Xi Jinping has suggested should be made into a global standard. But before we get started, let me take you back to January of this year. This is something that was posted on Twitter on January 11th, 10 days after health officials in Wuhan confirmed 27 cases of illness and closed the Huanan Seafood Wholesale Market. It's a tweet posted by someone called Edward C. Holmes. Here is what it says. All, an initial genome sequence of the coronavirus associated with the Wuhan outbreak is now available at http colon slash slash virological.org here. And there's a link. Its title is Novel 2019 Coronavirus Genome. On January the 3rd this year, a man named Yong Jin Zhang a professor working at the Shanghai Public Health and Clinical Center and School of Public Health received a metal box. Inside were samples of a virus from Wuhan. Professor Zhang and his team worked non-stop for two days to analyze in order to uncover the genetic sequence. And when they were finished, Professor Zhang realized this virus was very closely related to the SARS virus. He shared the genome sequence with the members of his consortium, including Professor Edward Holmes at the University of Sydney in Australia. Professor Holmes got onto the phone and rang Professor Zhang. 
he asked Professor Zhang for permission to publish the genome sequence to the world. He agreed, and Professor Holmes pressed the button marked Tweet. Within two days of that tweet being published, the Massachusetts-based biotech company Moderna had to sign a vaccine. And the race to develop a vaccine in the shortest amount of time in global medical history had begun. Here we are, 325 days later, and we really are at a historic turning point. We are bringing you back Josephine Ma, my colleague at the China Desk at the South China Morning Post. Hello, Joe. Hi, Kinling. So everybody's talking about the British government's distributing vaccines soon and also Russia's Sputnik vaccine coming out next week. What is happening with the Chinese vaccines? Yeah, um, that's what um, p- people are watching very closely. Since Pfizer and Moderna released the data, the Chinese officials came out and said, assured the public that uh, the Chinese vaccines are very effective as well. And then um, they are going to have data very soon. Uh, but so far, far, we haven't heard directly uh, from the Chinese government or the companies about when they're going to have the vaccine data. The Chinese trials are kind of like um, close to completion. And then, but last week, the Brazilian Institute involving in the trials of a Chinese vaccine with Sinovac from China said that the data for the Brazil um, trials should be available this week. So that's what people are watching right now. But for other vaccines developed by China, like for example, Sinopharm, they kept saying that our vaccines are very effective and uh, we're going to have the data soon. And the Chinese media actually reported that um, Sinopharm, that's the state owned company that is developing two Chinese vaccines have started applying to the Chinese regulator for conditional approval for their vaccines. That means um, the vaccines will be available for general public instead of just the high priority groups. That's what's going on in China right now. Um, Our colleague actually checked with the company after that announcement and um, there were like conflicting comments because one version we heard that is that they haven't started the application yet so we we don't know but one possibility could be they have started this what we call the rolling review process that means the developer kept handing in information and data to the regulator from time to time to accelerate, to accelerate um, the approval process. That's possible as well. But so far, we haven't heard anything concrete from the Chinese government or the companies about when they are going to approve um, the vaccines. But they have been like applying the vaccine to over a million people in China anyway. So that's what's going on. But that's something what um, scientists will be closely watching because um, now we got the data for mRNA vaccines, that's the vaccine from um, Pfizer and also the vaccines from Moderna and they are super effective and the Oxford vaccines, they have to clarify some data but still quite good, I mean the efficacy data and the Chinese data will show us how good the inactivated vaccines are. So that's something what uh, people are watching very closely. Joe, I remember talking to you back in our March episode, you said that to make vaccines Um, for such a big community of people under this pandemic within 12 months would be a really long shot. Did you honestly think that we'll be able to see the introduction of vaccines within this amount of time? Thanks for reminding me that uh, remark, because uh, it never happens in human history to come up with a vaccine in 12 months. So scientists were saying that uh, if you can develop a vaccine in 12 months, it will be like rocket speed. And... That's true because that never happens to human history before. And um, a lot of things have been done to accelerate the pace. For example, they combine different stages of clinical trials. And also they have been, as I said before, they uh, they submit data to the uh, regulators in batches to accelerate the, the pace for approval. A lot of things have been done to accelerate the pace. Usually it takes years or even a decade for a vaccine. So what have been achieved is remarkable. 
I mean, um, uh, and a lot of efforts has been made to make this happen. Of course, because of the need, the pressing need to come up with a vaccine, they accelerate the the approval process. But there is still one big question there: How long can a vaccine protect people from being infected? That means, like, how long the immunity can last? Because um, the trials only got a couple of months or several months of data. And um, we don't know. I mean, if the vaccines can protect people from getting infected for six months or for a year, and the length or the duration of the immunity is going to have a huge impact in the global inoculation program, and and it it will be a, a very big logistic problem as well. Because in the bad scenario, imagine if people ha- have a shot and then. They lose the immunity in six months, and other people are still waiting to be inoculated. Then what are you going to do with it? So that's the bad scenario. The good scenario is if the vaccines can protect people for at least a few years, then that would be great because by then, for example, like by ne- the end of next year, a lot of people will. Have been inoculated, and if they reach 60% of the population, then the herd immunity will be achieved, and the transmission of the disease may be halted. Then the vaccine will work, but it's still a big question mark. Another、uh, breakthrough with the vaccine development is with the mRNA vaccine, because、uh, this concept has been there for some years, but there has never been. A successful human mRNA vaccine before, but with the success of Pfizer and the success of Moderna vaccines, it shows the technology work. So apart from using this technology for COVID-19 vaccine, that technology can be applied to other diseases. For example, a lot of research has been done to vaccines, mRNA vaccines for cancer. So that may work as well. So what ha- I mean, no matter what the outcome is. The achievement in the past twelve months is still remarkable. So, Joe, you have mentioned a very a big question about the efficacy of vaccines, because as of now, we don't know how how long can the vaccines be. But there's also another problem, right, about refrigeration. Yes, that's a key concern. A lot of people are talking about、uh, even if we have a successful vaccine,、um, there'll be logistical nightmare. To transport the vaccines to different places and to have a large number of people inoculated, so storage and transportation is an issue, particularly with these two very effective and advanced vaccines. That's the mRNA vaccine by Pfizer and the mRNA vaccine by Moderna.、Um, for Pfizer, you have to store it in deep freezer that's minus seventy degrees Celsius. Moderna is slightly better. You can, but still, still quite demanding. You have to store it in minus twenty degrees Celsius, and not many facilities and countries have that kind of facility.、Um, so that's a、um, logistic problem that um, different um, countries are facing. I heard one scientist saying that even in the U.S., having enough deep freezer. That's minus seventy degrees Celsius、uh, is a problem, and、um, so there are a lot of talks in the U.S. about、uh, how they can overcome the logistical problems, and like the state governments have to come up with budgets to、um, invest in diffusers. So that's a key problem, and、um, it's simply not very realistic to have this kind of vaccines for developing countries which have.、Um, For infrastructure, so that's a key factor for the application and distribution of vaccines. And for the Chinese vaccines, if they are successful,、um, these are the very traditional ones, and they can be stored in normal fridge temperature. That's two to eight degrees Celsius. That's the same for. Oxford vaccine, so that success is very important for developing countries. That's what people are looking at, and that's also the advantage of the Chinese vaccines. Because、um, when I talk to people involving in observing the Chinese vaccines,、um, they always bring up this cold chain factor. If 
the Chinese vaccines are successful, it's a lot easier to distribute them and to transport them. And it's easier for developing countries to inoculate people. Because if you can't deliver vaccines to your target groups, that means you will have to bring your target groups to certain facilities to vaccinate them. And that will be nightmare because how can you prevent infections when so many people gather in a place for vaccination? So that's a lot of things that uh, regulators and also governments have to consider. The Oxford vaccine is also very competitive in a sense that they are cheap. It only costs like $3 US dollars per dose because Oxford and AstraZeneca has committed a large amount of vaccines for non-profit. So um, they are very competitive in price. We don't know about the pricing for the Chinese vaccines because in China, it costs about 16 to 20 US dollars per dose now. And whether they will lower the price if um, they export the vaccines for developing countries, we are not sure. But the Oxford vaccines cost about $3 per dose right now. The Moderna and uh, the Moderna vaccine costs around 20 US dollars, if I remember correctly. So um, that's also another factor that people uh, will have to take into account when we talk about the distribution of vaccines to developing countries. So let's talk about China. Do we know a date that the Chinese government is aiming to inoculate everybody? It's a very interesting question. The, the Chinese government hasn't uh, really announced its inoculation policy yet. Uh, what we know now is that um, they want to build a, what we call a, a shield. So they are uh, inoculating the so-called high-risk groups, um, those people who have exposure to for foreigners, for example, like border control and people handling vulnerable groups, for example, the people in elderly homes and like staffers in supermarkets, of course, medical staff. So they want to make sure like these high risk groups are inoculated. And of course, uh, people who travel abroad as well. And so that um, the transmission will be kind of um, be lower. I mean, or, or the transmission, the chance for transmission will be reduced. But whether China is eager to achieve herd immunity within a short time, that's a big question. And it may not be the case. China may not be very eager to achieve herd immunity very soon. One expert actually said uh, what uh, the, the capacity we are building now is mainly for uh, to produce enough vaccines for other countries in need because China has promised to make is vaccines a, glo- a, a global public good. Sounds like there will be a lot more of vaccine diplomacy coming up. We can read your stories at scmp.com, but where can we see your tweets? You can find me on Twitter at scmp underscore joma, J-O-M-A. Thanks, Joe. Before we move on, here's a quick reminder about a very important documentary made by our friends at SCMP Video. In 2019, Hong Kong witnessed social and political upheaval that rocked the city to its foundations, setting off shockwaves that continue to reverberate today. The people knew that this is so dangerous. Anybody could be just brought back to China for trial. The definitive documentary on the Hong Kong protests offers an in-depth look at the dramatic story of a city at a crossroads. It draws from extensive video footage, exclusive interviews with those caught up in the conflict, and unparalleled access to ground zero reporting by our award-winning journalists. China's Rebel City is a companion presentation to the book Rebel City, Hong Kong's Year of Water and Fire, that was published by The Post in June. You can watch China's Rebel City online, on demand, on YouTube, Facebook, or the South China Morning Post homepage, scmp.com. A few months ago, you may remember we spoke with John Ricketts, CEO of a company called Significant Systems. If you don't, here's a quick catch up for you. John and his team have developed a system called Earth AI, which measures the sentiment of every single comment posted on the internet. Yes, everything. John, have I explained that properly? I think the important thing to understand with Earth AI is 
we're able to look past the, the echo chambers and the media bubbles that really have become a feature of the world around us today. I mean, it's part of the reason that we're in so many of the sticky situations we're in. Uh, these media bubbles are um, really responsible for us um, getting further and further away from um, reality. How would you explain how Earth AI works? So with Earth AI, we're, we look at what's called the um, open internet. So it's really all parts of the internet. That includes social media. It includes more traditional media. And we're able to look at that and start to understand some of what's um, happening in the world around us. So tell us what you discovered about this phrase we're seeing and hearing more of lately, vaccine anxiety. So vaccine anxiety or vaccine hesitancy has very quickly established itself as a part of, part of our world. It's um, very much a part of uh, the major markets we look at. And the defining characteristic is really the, um, the depth of emotion surrounding this issue and that emotion comes from both sides there's, there's very clearly a lot of people who are very very um, anxious and have anxiety around the vaccine and there's also people who are very frustrated with the people who have that anxiety and have that hesitancy so this is going to run uh, pretty much through 2021 it's going to be um, a real issue and different cultures are going to approach it in different ways. Can you unpack a little bit more about what this means? Vaccine hesitancy differs from the perception around the actual vaccine itself quite significantly. When we look at the the planet's um, feelings around the vaccine, what we see is um, really one of intense expectation. So people very much see this as we've been starting to play out these last few weeks. It's very much uh, on its way. There's uh, very strong expectation around that. And then there's some overall disquiet around it. Vaccine hesitancy itself has far, uh, far more intense uh, depth of feeling. So when we see emotions at this level, they're, they're very visceral. So we're moving into a territory where we're really not going to be having um, rational conversations with people. This is, they're really being driven by the depth of feeling here. So it's an emotional conversation and we need to understand that this is how people feel about this and we're going to have to engage on that level. Now, John, we also asked you about a particular concept that we alluded to in a previous podcast, and that was what people in the West thought about being inoculated with a Chinese-made vaccine. What were the results? So there's been a very dramatic shift over the last few weeks um, around that issue. When we first looked, the key feature was the world was very excited for a vaccine and the point of manufacture really wasn't the issue. Now, place of manufacture is a big, uh, a big deal. <laughs> so when we start to look at the... Um, the narratives in the world uh, around the different uh, vaccines, what we see is that there is a very strong negative when we start to look at uh, Western markets, especially around um, a Chinese vaccine. It is not favoured and um, there's going to be long-term issues around this. Now, what about this idea put forward by Alan Joyce, the CEO of the Australian airline Qantas? He suggested that the terms and conditions of airline tickets might change so that only people who have had the vaccine can travel. Have you been looking into that? And what did you find out? So we, we looked at that um, on the day of the, um, this being floated and then the subsequent days. And, and what we found was that domestically within Australia, this played very well. So very much seen as a, 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 as a really good idea. Um, when we looked internationally, there was more concerns around it, but in general, uh, in general, pretty uh, positive. So that's quite a marked. Um, when we look at vaccine passport, it's quite a marked difference to what we're seeing around the the vaccine itself, and that does suggest that one way of, um, if you wanted to encourage adoption, you go harder on the um, vaccine passport narrative because. Um, yeah, it's seen as a it's seen as a as a good idea. It sort of fits with a lot of our existing expectations. If we go to visit certain countries, then we expect to be vaccinated. So that might be uh, a route to um, 
dampening some of the、um, some of the negatives we're seeing in the world. We will check in with John in a few weeks' time to see how sentiments are changing. If we are not going to see a global rollout of COVID-19 vaccines for months, if not years, then how are we going to get on with our lives? Many countries around the world have been trying to roll out contact tracing apps for people to download into their phones, and from the evidence we've seen in the UK and in Australia, they have been multi-million-dollar failures. But maybe there's another, much easier way. Let me explain. Right now. Hong Kong is going through a fourth wave surge of coronavirus. Nightclubs are closed, restaurants are restricted to only two people per table, and live music is banned. But if I want to go to the gym, I walk in the door, switch on the camera in my phone, and hold it up to a QR code on a sign at the door. It opens a Google document, which asks me my name, my phone number, and to answer a short series of yes/no questions of whether I've been exposed to. Or been in the same building as somebody who has had COVID-19, as well as if I have any symptoms. I click no on them all, and go inside. Now this data helps with contact tracing. If anyone inside this gym is later reported with the virus, the company can check the data uploaded and call each person to tell them to get tested and to isolate. It's a relatively new concept being rolled out in some countries, but since February. QR codes have been a crucial part of how mainland China has managed the movements of its population. One of the reporters on our technology desk has been following this, and in fact, Xin Mei Shen normally sit about ten feet away from me in this newsroom. But Xin Mei is on her way back to her hometown in northeastern China to visit her parents for Christmas. Xin Mei, where are you now?、Um, so I'm in Zhuhai、uh, under hotel quarantine. Uh, it's gonna be a two-week thing,、um, yeah. But your parents live in far northeast China. Why on earth are you in quarantine in Zhuhai, which is like next door to Hong Kong? So some of the major、um, cities for people coming in from overseas to quarantine is Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, basically. But、uh, I've been hearing that Zhuhai hotels are cheaper and nicer,、um, which turned out to be partly true because my hotel is.、Uh, Very crappy, but I mean it's、um, it's more spacious than my flat in Hong Kong, so I have no complaints. Always assessing the facts on their merit. Very good. So Xin Mei, can you help people in the U.S., in Australia, and in the U.K. understand these QR codes? I mentioned that they originated in Japan, but when and how did they become so popular in mainland China? Sure. Basically, it. Um, got popular as、uh, mobile payment tools,、uh, WeChat Pay and Alipay started to take off、uh, in China, which was、um, the first half of this decade.、Um, it's essentially the easiest solution for everyone. So for customers, you all you need is a smartphone with a camera,、um, and it's also very easy for businesses to set up.、Um, so it's for years now. It's literally everywhere.、Um, you can see them at、um, restaurants. Uh, wet markets, mom and pop shops, and、um, taxis,、um, and it's almost always about payments.、Um, so sometimes you scan a shop's QR code to pay them, or、um, sometimes they scan the QR code on your payment app to charge you. And of course, you can scan a friend's QR code to give them money、uh, when you need to. So yeah, it's just massively popular. Almost everybody who has a smartphone knows how to use it and are used to it.、Um, yeah, and that definitely laid. Um, sort of the groundwork for its role during COVID. Back in March, you were reporting how China was using QR codes as part of its pandemic control strategy. Can you tell us how that worked? Yeah. So、um, in Shanghai and a few other cities, they put up QR codes on,、um, say, the windows of subway trains.、Um, what it does is, when you scan it, it lets you know your compartment number. Um, and then you need to put in your phone number. So,、um, in theory, if someone who has COVID was in the same compartment as you were at the same time,、um, the system would alert you. But from what I was hearing, at least in Shanghai, it hasn't been a su- successful program. One thing is that it's largely voluntary. Of course, there was no one there to make sure that everybody is in every compartment was doing it. Also, some people were complaining that these QR codes are placed at spots that are very inconvenient for people to reach. Like they might be right in the middle of the window, which is 
impossible for most people to scan when the train's crowded. Yeah, it was like that when it was first launched in late February. And it's even less used now when things are pretty much back to normal in China. But that wasn't the only use of QR codes in mainland China. There was another type, which were used not for transport, but for people. These colored health QR codes, on the other hand, is uh, mandatory. And even now, people still have to use them a lot. Um, so, basic, so basically, these are mini programs on WeChat and Alipay. Uh, but uh, to be clear, they're not operated by these two companies. Actually, they're essentially portals run by different levels of the government. Um, so cities and provinces, etc. cetera. Um, and WeChat and Alipay became the platforms for them, um, basically because um, they're the apps that almost all smartphone users have. So yeah, there are three colors, which probably already sounds familiar at this point. Um, if you have a green one, you're free to go anywhere. But if your code is yellow or red, you'll need to be quarantined for um, either seven or 14 days. And um, there are checkpoints across cities like malls, um, offices or residential neighborhoods. Um, uh, There are people there to stop and to stop you and make sure that your code is green before they let you pass. Wait, so there's someone stopping me and asking me to open up my phone before I'm allowed in the shopping center or the restaurant or the hotel? How do people get their color codes? How does this system work? Good question. Um, So how it works is largely opaque. Um, They're not being transparent about it. But from what people gathered, it pulls information from um, a range of government databases. Uh, both local and national, um, including if your medical records show that you have tested positive or have those symptoms, also your travel history, uh, because the government has records of people's train and um, flight tickets. And then it also pulls location data from telcos, uh, your mobile carriers, because um, in China, your phone number is um, linked to your real name. So a lot of that is the system trying to decide if you have a risk of having COVID based on where you have been in the last 14 days. But then again, there are probably things that we don't know about because it is um, very opaque and it's, it's uh, also constantly changing, actually. So have there been reports of being wrongly classified or accidentally classified as being infected because of the system? Oh, yeah, absolutely. There are definitely problems, especially in the early stage. Um, There were cases when people's codes would just change color for no reason. Um, And when that happens, you can file an appeal in the program. But that's definitely going to be a process that's going to cost you a lot of time and energy. Um, And then there was one time when um, uh, we actually wrote about this, when Hangzhou's health code had a large scale malfunctioning. Uh, which led to a very chaotic morning rush hour, basically, in subway stations. So, yeah, there's definitely glitches like that. And it's also just generally very cumbersome to use, especially when you travel across cities, uh, because different cities have different health code systems. um, And a lot of times they don't work together very well. Currently in Hong Kong, we are seeing the government finally trying to roll out its own QR code system for restaurants and bars. And we are also seeing the different state governments in Australia all introducing QR code systems to help manage contact tracing for what they call COVID normal living until vaccines arrive. But this idea is also being promoted by Chinese President Xi Jinping. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so President Xi proposed on the uh, G20 summit recently that there should be a global mechanism where um, countries create these QR code systems that's based on uh, COVID test results and that they should recognize each other's QR codes when people travel across countries. Um, So he said that it should help create a um, quote-unquote orderly flow of people. But yeah, there hasn't been any details to that proposal yet. That's Shi Mei Chen, currently in quarantine, about to make a 3,000-kilometer journey to see her parents for Christmas. Shi Mei, where can people find you on Twitter? I'm on Twitter at Shen Xin Mei, S-H-E-N-X-I-N-M-E-I. Yeah, it's a pretty long handle. Of course, you can find Shimei's work in the tech section of SEMP.com. So we have here with us Simone McCarthy. She has been speaking to us about all the diplomacy related to vaccines and coronavirus ever since it broke out in January. So Simone, we know that in the past few weeks, 
there has been some updates on the coronavirus origins investigation. Yeah, thanks, Kinling. Happy to be here again. It's it's really interesting to think about this. Like we have all of this exciting news coming out about the vaccine, and yet we still have this question about. How did this all begin? December 1st marked the one-year anniversary of the first known case of COVID-19, um, at least as according to official records. And so it's really been a, a full year and, and almost a full year since it was brought into the public eye that this whole uh, outbreak was starting. And at that time, of course, we had no idea it was going to come to take over all of our lives across the world. So yes, um, there has been some major developments around trying to find answers, although there's still a very few answers about where this where this virus actually came from. Um, scientists broadly believe that the virus that causes COVID-19 came from a bat before crossing into some kind of intermediary animal and then passing into humans. Um, and the closest known relative of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, as it's known, was identified in southeastern China. But we still don't have the progenitor relative of this virus itself. So anyway, science aside, the what the news about what's happening is that the WHO has finally gotten together the international team of experts that's going to work in collaboration with Chinese scientists on a mission to get to the bottom of what happened. And so they had their first virtual meeting on October 30th, um, and WHO has said that They have assurances from China that they're going to get experts on the international team of 10 experts on the ground in China as soon as possible. Uh, Chinese colleagues are already starting that work in what's known as the phase one studies, which is taking place in Wuhan. Um, And so they're looking at the market. They're trying to where some of the first cases were linked to. They're also trying to actually go back into the records, such as um, you know, uh, mortality records, any kind of um, CT scans of people's lungs that may be available, as well as uh, samples of blood that might be available from before December 2019, so that they can try and understand the timeline of when this emerged. So you've mentioned phase one of the study, but how long do we expect until a result can be concluded to end this whole diplomatic feud? <laughs> well, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think the most scientists that you would speak to who are involved in tracing outbreaks would say this could take years. Wow. Um, and uh, the WHO's Mike Ryan, who's the executive director of their health emergencies program, has said in a way that it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. Mm. Uh, probably we won't know, okay, it was this bat who uh, got into a fight with this uh, civet cat who then infected this person. I mean, just uh, making up a, a theory there, but, you know, we won't know something with that specificity. But we can hopefully understand, okay, it may have been a bad in this region and there are these risk factors which may have brought people or other animals into contact or it was the animals on this specific farm because wild animals are also farmed in China. Um, so we may be able to garner some more clues about that. And the reason that that matters is because that can really help us to change our risk behaviors, not just in China, but everywhere around the world. Um, And I should say, I mean, it is the WHO has been clear that if the signs end up leading out of China, for example, um, these bats are are known to be across Southeast Asia. So maybe this is a a wildlife spillover that happened um, in another country. All of that is possible, but it's just a matter of starting in Wuhan and unwinding those clues. But yeah, how long it may take is is sort of anyone's guess. Um, The phase one studies they want to do over the next couple of months, though. So, Simone, in the past few weeks, um, the SCMP has published different stories about there have been evidence circulating in different places, actually, maybe before an outbreak was recorded in Wuhan. So can you tell us more about that? Yeah, sure. So it has been an interesting thing that has gained a lot of attention. Um, Basically, 
One of the tools that scientists have in order to better understand how an outbreak has spread or what kinds of populations have been affected is testing uh, people's blood for antibodies to a virus, and then they'll know if they had a previous infection or not. And so we had a case uh, which was published last month from a group of Italian researchers. And what they did was they went back and they looked at this um, these group of blood samples which had been collected for a cancer screening sort of across the country. And those samples started in September of 2019. And they actually found evidence of what they called uh, SARS-CoV-2 specific antibodies. And they actually found antibodies that are specific for the coronavirus in those blood samples. Um, and so they said that that may have indicated that the virus was actually spreading in Italy already uh, in September of last year. And if we remember the the first uh, cases that were really confirmed within China, that was around, um, you know, December, January of, of last year and, and this year. So that would certainly set the timeline back. And there was another study that was just published this week coming from the U.S. CDC, which also said that they found evidence as far back of these same kinds of antibodies as far back as December 13th. Um, so it's all really interesting. And the WHO has said that they've already reached out to the Italian research group, and they're going to work with them and run some additional tests on the samples. Um, you know, there's been a few of these different things here and there. Uh, France had a case which was a confirmed PCR positive test from the end of December, which was also quite surprising given that they didn't think they had a case for almost another month after that. So there's a lot of these kinds of bits and bops of, of evidence that we see. But I guess the thing that I would say is important to keep in perspective is that these antibody tests are are notoriously not that specific. And so we can, it's not to say that information can't be gleaned from them, but they really need to be uh, perhaps vetted by additional experts and using more specific assays. Um, what that really means is like there's a lot of coronaviruses that are circulating all the time um, that just cause common cold. Well, not a lot. I should say there's four. and But it is possible even that there are some that we don't know of. As recently as 2004, only one of those uh, circulating coronaviruses was discovered. So it's possible there's even another one that just causes light symptoms that we don't know about. So we need to under really understand what exactly is it that these tests are picking up. And there have been a lot of um, you know eminent experts who have come out and said, I don't know if the Italian study really means this, or I'm not sure if the U.S. study really is evidence of this. And it doesn't mean that that uh, that the timeline isn't earlier. And in fact, I think that probably, you know, if, if the more that we look, the more interesting things we'll find. And, and the WHO has also said that they're quite interested in looking at all of this evidence that comes out around the world. So it'll be interesting to see, um, you know, how that will also feed into this quest for the origins of the virus. It's definitely important to clarify, though, that we still don't know where the origins are. And so everything is is just speculation. And I, I'm kind of report, re repeating the WHO line here, but I think it's a good one. Um, you know, it's important to not speculate and, and to just follow the science on this as, as political as it has become. And where can we find you on Twitter? I'm at... My first name's Simone, S-I-M-O-N-E-L-M-C. Thanks for your time. I know you're very busy and we'll get back to you next time. Always a pleasure. That's all we have for you in this episode of Inside China, in this historic week for pandemic news. It's a very different Christmas season that is beginning out there this year. But as always, we wish you the very best. Be careful, wash those hands and wear that mask. My name is Kinling Lo. Thank you for listening. Thanks for sharing and rating us. And for all you people commenting on YouTube, 得閒飲茶啦. Bye for now. For more podcasts from the South China Morning Post, head to scmp.com, where you can hear more about technology, trade, culture, and society. <laughs>